Good afternoon, everyone. Today is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It is with great honor and thankfulness of heart that we are here another day. And because the Lord has allowed us another day, we should be thankful. And we should give him the praise and the glory and the honor for another chance of life. Because he didn't give us life because we had earned it or we deserve it. No, he gave us another day of life because of his grace and his mercy. And we can be wise enough to find reasons to be thankful, then we also would enjoy the joy of our salvation. We can find reasons to rejoice because of another day of life. And we can rejoice in the promise that we have in his son, Christ Jesus, the promise of eternal life. So we have every reason to have joy in our lives, in spite of the circumstances that we may be going through. If it's trying times, we have reason to rejoice and be thankful. If it's a season of joy, if it's a season of abundance and prosperity, we have reason to be thankful and humble. In all seasons and all things, we can find reasons to be thankful because we have eternal salvation through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we know that whatever we are going through here on this earth is just temporary. It's just short term. It's just for a little while. But at the end of it all, and for eternity, we should have life and the abundant life through Christ Jesus. And that is our joy. And that is the joy of our salvation. And no one can take that away from us. But we can forfeit it, we can give it away by not being thankful for what our Lord and Savior has done. Many times in life, we live our lives and we forget the things that the Lord has done for us. We've trusted the Lord, we've depended on the Lord and the Lord was gracious enough the Lord was willing and he was able to do things that we didn't know how it was going to get done. He has came into our life and he has rescued us from financial situations that we had no idea how we were going to overcome. Many times when we were growing up, you hear people say we had to rob Peter to pay Paul. You know, our parents or even ourselves only made three, four dollars an hour. Parents had more than one kid. Had to pay the bills of the house. Pay for food. And take care of all the other things that you can imagine in a household and for a family. But they made it work with the little that they had. You see, when they look back on it, they realize how the Lord did so much with the little that they had. See, when we put our little bit in the hands of the Lord, he would stretch it out. If we trust the little bit that we have with the Lord, he will stretch it out. So we can remember the Lord making a way when there was no way as we were coming up. And even now, many of us now may be facing certain situations financially and we're just dependent on the Lord to put us through. See, the other things in our life, many of us have gone through sickness and the Lord had pulled us through the sickness when the doctor and all the other professionals didn't really know how the outcome was going to be. Many of us have overcome cancer. Many of us have overcome uh, many other physical ailments 
that has put a lot of strain and pressure on their lives. But we trusted on God. We leaned and we depended on the Lord. And he healed us and brought us through. And we're still here today because of him. See, we think back on our lives and family situation, the loss of a loved one, of a parent, of a close friend, maybe even a spouse, maybe even a child. And the pain was so great and we did not know how we, let alone was gonna make it minute by minute. And now the Lord has comforted us and strengthened us that we can continue to live our lives in spite of our loss because we have the confidence and the hope that we will see each other again. But the Lord has brought us through. He was with us throughout the entire time. He helped us. See, we serve a God that can do anything. We serve a God that cares for us. He loves us. See, he is omnipotent, all power, all powerful. And he's omniscient, he's all knowing. So when we serve a God like that, how could we ever forget who he is and what he has done for us? See, there's so many things that the Lord has done for us. Many times when we didn't have the job we wanted, or we could not even get it, we didn't have a job at all. The Lord delivered us with a job. And even in the job that we have, he delivered us into positions that we never thought we could have get. Didn't see us being able to obtain those positions, but somehow, some way, he delivered us and he made a way for us to get in those positions. See, our Lord and Savior has done something for all of us that we should never forget. And not only never forget it, we should always use it as motivation, encouragement, and as strength for us to face what we have to face tomorrow, today, and tomorrow. See, when we get weak, when we get weak, when things, times get tough in our lives, situation, trying times come upon us and they come upon us all. We need to find our strength. Even when we can't trace the Lord, feel the Lord, know if he's there, or wonder does he even care that what we're going through. We need to find our strength in the Lord. Now, how can we find our strength in the Lord? All we must do is look back on our lives and look at all the things that the Lord has brought us through. See, when we look back on the things that the Lord has brought us through, it gives us strength to know that if he has brought us this far, he has done this for us, and he has done that for us. When we did not know how it's going to happen, he made a way. It's that same God that's still with us today, and he will bring us through what we are facing today. See, those things that he has brought us through is the title of our lesson today. Our lesson's title is... Ebenezer Stone, Ebenezer's Stone. Now, many times, I don't know if you, I remember the name Ebenezer, never really knew what it really meant. All I know was that it was churches and 
Montgomery and probably churches everywhere in most of our uh, somewhat cities of any kind of size. They were called Ebenezer, Ebenezer Baptist Church, Ebenezer. And I just always remember that name, Ebenezer. And many people know the name of Ebenezer from the Christmas story, Ebenezer Scrooge. But there is an Ebenezer in the Bible. And it's not so much of a person, but it symbolizes an act, an act of God in our lives. And we all have Ebenezer stones. If you don't have Ebenezer stones, then you have forgotten what the Lord has done for you. And you are in a very dangerous position because when you forget what the Lord has done for you, then you don't know who he is. You don't really understand how much he loves you. And you don't know how you're going to face tomorrow. Because how can you know? Because you don't know what he has done for you already. So our lesson text comes from 1 Samuel 7, 12. And I'll read the text and then I will set the table and the context for our message today. <clears throat> 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. And we pretty much look at the whole entire chapter of 7 chapter of 1 Samuel. But a verse I really want us to key in on is verse 12. And it reads in the King James Version, Then Samuel took a stone and set it between Mizpah and Shin and called the name of it Ebenezer, saying, Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. Now read that in the NIV. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen. He named it Ebenezer, saying, thus far, the Lord has helped us. <laughs> thus far, the Lord has helped us. What a powerful statement to say. And when we apply that to our lives, thus far, the Lord has helped us. Let me put it in a little bit more a common language for us. The Lord has brought us this far. Look how far the Lord has brought us. If we look back out over our lives at where we started from and where we are now, we can truly say the Lord has helped us. See, that's enough just to rejoice if we just think back on what the Lord has done for us. Glory, hallelujah. That's just such a shouting moment because it was so many times in our life we did not really know how we was going to make it. But the Lord pulled us through. See, we trusted the Lord and he brought us through. The Lord has helped us thus far. So Ebenezer stands for the Lord has helped us. And an Ebenezer stone, Samuel has set an Ebenezer stone in between two cities, Mizpah and Shen. And the, long, the, the stone stood for the fact that the Lord has just helped his people. Now, what has the Lord done for Samuel to set a stone to represent the Lord helping them. Well, we have to look back in the history of the Jewish people. We know that the Jewish people came from Egypt. They went down into Egypt as a family, 12 sons and Jacob. And they stayed in Egypt for over close to 400 years. And they came out of Egypt, a nation, and with the promise that he gave Abraham of a land that they will possess and that will be their own. And in this land, 
they will be God's people. He will be their God and they will be his people. And he promised them that he would bless them, that bless them, curse them, that curse them. He will provide and take care of them. Only if they continue to keep him first in their lives. How many, how many of you know that the same promise applies to your life today? See, as believers in Christ, we must continue to keep him first in our lives. We studied a Sunday school lesson a few weeks ago. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things, what are the things that were all the needs that you have in life? See, shall come unto you, whatever need that you have. And see, Jesus was teaching them that it's no need for us to worry if we keep God first for in our lives. See, that's a promise from God that he will, that he will uphold. A promise that he will keep. See, there's no need for us to worry. All that we need is in Christ Jesus, in our Lord and Savior. So we see God's people coming into the promised land. And they walked in the wilderness for over 40 years. And when they came out of the wilderness, they had to cross the Jordan into the promised land. Moses has died now. Joshua is the leader. And when they crossed the Jordan, coming into the promised land, the Lord, while the Jordan was still parted, the Lord told a representative leader for each of the 12 tribes to put a stone in the middle of the lake. And each family was to stack a stone, 12 stones. And those stones was to serve as a memorial so each time that they walk by, and anybody walk by those stones, they would know that this is where the Lord fulfilled his promise on bringing his people from slavery, from bondage, from the greatest power on earth into the promised land. He saved them. And those stones were a memorial of what the Lord has done for his people. See, the Lord will provide. He will take care of us. But once God's people got into the promised land, they began to do and to forget what the Lord has done for them. Don't be too hard on God's people because we do the same thing if we're not careful in our lives. Once God provides for us and takes care of us and does things for us, and we go from worrying each and every day how we're going to make it to uh, living good, money in the bank, things taken care of, good bill of health, then we walk around like we did all this to be in the position that we had, forgetting that it was his grace and mercy that allowed us to be in the situation that we're in at this point in time. We forget what the Lord has done for us. And when you forget what the Lord has done for us, you fall into sin, idolatry, and more importantly, you fall away from the Lord. When you fall away from the Lord, he's not in your presence. And now you're living in your own strength, in your own power, in your own might. And your strength and your power didn't get you where you were today. It was the Lord. So that's where our people, God's people, Israel, they're in a the position right now. They are a group of people who have forgotten about their Lord. 
after bringing them into the promised land, they began to mingle in as time went on, day by day, they began to mingle in with the people that were in the land. Remember, they didn't rid themselves of all the people that were in the land. So they began to fall victim to the idolatry and the life that the people were living around them. And each time that they would fall into sin, the Lord would have to send them a deliverer. And they would call the deliverer a judge. And the judge would have to deliver them from their oppressors, the Philistines, the Amorites, who live in the land. And he would have to send someone to deliver his people from the hands of their oppressors. And each time that they became oppressed is because that they had lived, they were living a life apart from the Lord. They were living a worldly life. They were not living a life that was pleasing to the Lord. And what does sin do? Sin leads to captivity. You become captive to the sin that you, you live in. You become a slave to it and you trapped it and you can't rescue yourself from sin. See, the Lord is the only one that can rescue you from sin, can save you from sin. And he would send a judge. Samson was a judge. Jephthah was a judge. Deborah was a judge. Gideon was a judge. And each time that the deliverer would come, the judge would come and say to the people, they will follow the Lord and they will be obedient to the Lord and they will have peace in the land. But just as soon as time passes, they forget what the Lord had done for them and they fall right back into sin. See, how many of us know that we can easily, when we take our mind on what the Lord done for us, we easily fall back into sin, feeling like it's us. And then we're living our life then. At that point, we are living our life without power. without the promises of God. And we see this is what God's people, his people are going through. Now, it's come to the time in the history of the lives and of, of the people of Israel where they're coming down to a changing of the guard. God's people has been, are now being uh, persecuted and held captive by the Philistine people. How did they get in this position? Well, they had a prophet in the land, a high priest in the land. His name was Eli. Eli served well for the Lord, but Eli had two sons. And Eli now has become very old and can't really serve the Lord as he has done well in his years but his two sons were not like he was his two sons were evil in the sight of the lord the bible said that they would lay with women at the gate and then they would take the sacrifices that were brought to be sacrificed to the lord and they would eat it and do it what with it what they so choose they would not follow the laws and the regulations that they were supposed to follow as the priests. They basically established their own religion and did what they want to do. And in doing so, the Lord judged Israel. You would think, well, if Eli was a good, why um, would they do it with Eli still? Well, Eli did not discipline his son. See, we as parents must, we are here responsible for discipline and raising our kids 
to the best of our ability. Now we will all, any parent will all be telling a story if we say that our kid never done something wrong, no matter how hard and how much and how much care we took to raise our kids. At times they're gonna fall away and do certain, something wrong. But as parents, we must continue to chastise, teach, guide, educate, stand up and tell what's right and wrong to our kids, no matter what. Eli's fault was he never did take command and charge over what his sons were doing. And it led to not only judgment for the sons, it led for judgment for Eli and judgment for the nation of Israel. The Philistines came down to attack God's people. God's people were living in idolatry, following after the ways of Eli's son, Hophni and Phinehas. They went out to fight against the Philistines, and the Philistines defeated God's, uh, God's people. So they came back to a group, and they said, we know what we can do. We can take the Ark of the Covenant into battle with us. And with the Ark of the Covenant, the Lord will surely give us victory. So they took the Ark of the Covenant into battle with them against the Philistines. And when the Ark of the Covenant came in to the camp, the people began to yell. The Israelite people began to yell and celebrate and have loud roars that shook the ground. And the Philistines began to get nervous, worried, and afraid. But they had a leader that told them to uh, stand put, gird themselves, and prepare to fight. And they went out against God's people, and they defeated God's people and took the Ark of the Covenant. Now, how many of you know that just having the Ark of the covenant does not save you. See, the Ark of the Covenant represents the presence of the Lord. But they had the Ark of the Covenant, but they did not have the Lord. See, religion can't save us. It's our relationship that we share with the Lord is what saves us. That is our power. Not that we sing, we usher, and we go to church and come home. That doesn't save you. It's the word. It's your heart. It's your relationship. See, that's what saves you. Don't ever think because you go to church every Sunday, you're going to heaven. No, it's the word that you hear. It's a relationship that you have with God. It's the new life you have in Christ is what saves. Is you living for the Lord, your obedience to him. See, that's what God's people didn't have. They were still serving worship idol gods. They just thought that they could take the, the, the ark into battle and the Lord just going, it's like they were controlling, we'll get the Lord and we'll whoop you. No, we don't control the Lord. The Lord controls us. So the Ark of the Covenant was taken into the Philistine camp. And we know anything about the Philistine, they had five cities. And when the Ark of the Covenant was in a city, you look over in uh, 1 Samuel, you look in the fifth chapter, We see that the Ark of the Covenant was taken captive into a town. And they put the Ark of the Covenant into a room with the Philistine god Dagon. And they placed Dagon in, the, in front of the Ark of the Covenant. And they came back the next morning, and Dagon was laying flat face down on the floor. So they stood him up again before the Ark of the Covenant. And they came back the next day, Dagon had fallen down again, but this time his legs had fallen off, his arms 
had fallen off. It was just a body. And they realized that there was something going on with this Ark of the Covenant. See, our Lord is a jealous God. What did he say? There shall not be any other God, what, before me. And it says, the Bible says that because the Ark of the Covenant was in the land of the Philistine, it weighed heavy on the cities that they were in. In each city, the people, the Philistine people in that city began to get tumors, began to get hemorrhoids. And it say a plague broke out in each city that the Ark of the Covenant was in. So finally, after they've been to every city, the, it says that the, the, uh, the witches, the, the religious leaders, they all came together and said, look, this thing is bringing us nothing but trouble. How about we just give this thing back to the people of Israel? So let's do a test and see if we should give it back or not. But when we give it back, we want to show honor and show retribution to the God of the Israel people. We will put uh, golden rats in the ark, on the cart with the ark. And we also will put um, shape, golden shaped tumors in the cart and send it back to the people of Israel. Now, to test whether this was truly their God moving or was it just coincidence, they said we'll put this on a cart. And on this cart, we will have two oxen. Two oxen, two cows, I, I should say. They have, they have, each have a calf, but they have not fed their calves yet. And oxen are drawn to the calves that they just birthed to nurture them and to give them milk. So we'll put it on this road. The road can do two, go two ways. It can go straight into the city of Israel, city in Israel, or the road can fork off into a Philistine city where the calves of these two oxen were. So in normal circumstance, the, 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 uh, the oxen would have walking in the direction of where their calves were because naturally they would want to uh, take and nurture for the calves that they had just birthed. But instead of the calves of the oxen, the cows going toward where the direction of the Philistine city, where their calves were at, they continue to do the unnatural thing and go in the city, go straight toward the city of, in, in Israel. So the leaders, the religious leaders in Philistine knew that it was a sign. That was a sign to know that, that this was not a coincidence. It was the power of their God that was doing all the things to them in their city. So now the Ark of the Covenant is back in the hands of the Israelite people. They say when the two oxen came walking into the town that the people saw the Ark of the Covenant and began to celebrate, began to have joy because of the Ark of the Covenant was back in the hands of the Jewish people. But notice that the Ark of the Covenant had to be dealt a certain way. The people in the town in which the Ark of the Covenant went into did not handle the Ark of the Covenant the way it should have been handled. And because they did not handle it the way it should have been handled, they were 70 people were killed in the town that the ark came in. 
They did not know how to handle the art. Now, what does that tell us? Well, we can't serve God how we want to serve God. We have to serve him in a manner that is pleasing to him. See, how must we come to God? We must have come to Christ humbly, repentant. See, and he give grace to the humble. See, now, if we look at 1 Samuel 6, the last few verses, verses 19 through 21, I read it in the NLT. But the Lord killed 70 men from Beth Shemesh, Beth Shemesh because they looked into the ark of the Lord, and the people mourned greatly because of what the Lord had done. Who is able to stand in the presence of the Lord, this holy God? They cried out, where can we send the ark from here? So they sent messengers to the people of Korea, Jerem, and told them the Philistines have returned the ark of the Lord. Come here and get it. And that leads us up to the beginning of our lesson today. Now, God's people have been, the ark of the covenant have not been in the land for years. They have been out of the presence of the Lord for years. See, it's when we walk in sin, we leave the presence of the Lord. And what a life we prepare ourselves. We find ourselves in captivity to sin and the sinful nature of the life that we live in. And we see God's people in captivity and under rule of the Philistine nation because they were not in the presence of the Lord. And we get to verse one in chapter seven, it says, and the men, and I read it in the NLT. So the men of Kareth Jirian came to get the ark of the Lord. They took it to the hillside home of Abinadab and ordained it and ordained and ordained Eliza, his son, to be in charge of it. The ark remained in Kiriath Jerem for a long time, 20 years in all. During that time, all Israel mourned because it seemed the Lord had abandoned them. Now look at God's people at this point in time. The ark is taken to Kiriath Jerem. And it says that the people mourned. And have been in Kiriath Jerem for a long time, 20 years and all. Now it was, it stayed in Kiriath Jerem for over a hundred years total. Because Samuel only uh was made aware of it and uh was used it and came to it after it had been there 20 years, but it stayed in that city. If you remember, David came along about 80 years later and moved the ark from Kerib Jerim to, to the city of Jerusalem. And David himself did not know how to handle the ark. And you know the story that David put the ark on a cart driven by a horse, I mean by oxen. And the, 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 the cart hit a hole and, and the ark began to fall from the cart. And Uzzah reached out to catch the ark, to keep it from falling. And he touched the ark. And when he touched the ark, the Lord struck him down and killed him because he touched the ark. Only Levites were supposed to touch the ark. And David immediately stopped transporting the ark and they took it to Obed-Edom's house. And it stayed at Obed-Edom's house for three months until so they can figure out how to transport. They had to go back and look in Leviticus, look in numbers on how to transport and carry the ark. The ark had to be carried by Levites 
and they couldn't put it on a horse or animal driven cart. It had to be carried on the shoulders. They had to put poles. They had the, the ark had little holes at the bottom where you can put a pole in a hole. And those that you put long poles in, the Levites could grab the ark and they can walk and carry the ark. It could not be put on a horse driven cart or carried by any other, or handled by any other person than a Levite. Once David did learn and he did bring the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. And you remember the story it said that he danced. He danced himself naked as the Ark was coming into Jerusalem. And his wife, Micah, chastised him for dancing naked before the Lord. And the Lord punished Micah. And her punishment, she, he, the Lord judged and rebuked Micah. And her judgment was that she could not have kids. For David. So the Ark of the Covenant had to be dealt and carried a certain way. And that's really uh, such a lesson for us because we cannot serve the Lord the way we want to serve him, when and how we want to serve him. No. Not at all. So the ark remained in career Jerem for a long time, 20 years in all. And during that time, all Israel mourned because it seemed the Lord had abandoned them. Now, we see God's people just like they did in the book of Judges. Now, they've been so long out of the presence of God, they find themselves missing something in life. See, when we go in sin, we 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 in sin so long, we find ourselves missing something in life. We realize that sin is not the answer. A life without God is not a complete life. And you realize something is missing. And we see God's people realizing that they're missing something. They're missing something. They said they, were, they mourned. They were sorrowful. Now, now we see that the people are ready for a revival. How do I know that they are ready for a revival? Because they are longing for the Lord. They realize that their life is not complete without the presence of the Lord. And not only is not complete without the presence of the Lord, that they now also want the Lord to be in their life. And they're prepared to change their life to, to have the Lord come in back into their lives. And see, that is what you call being ready for a revival. See, now we're going to witness one of the biggest revivals in the history of Israel. Then Samuel said to all the people of Israel, if you want to return to the Lord with all your hearts, get rid of your foreign gods and your images of Asherah. Turn your hearts to the Lord and obey him alone. Then he will rescue you from the Philistines. Now, that is talking to God's people. But let me know, when we, but let me let you know that when he's talking about talking to God's people, it's also talking to you. See, if you're at a point in your life where um, you feel like you're not on fire, you're not um, um, something missing from your life, you, you have sin in your life, you're, you're further away from God than you would like, then he's talking to you. See, this is the month that we usually have revival in the African-American community. It's June or July. And see, when we used to have revival, we used to have to pray that the Lord send us a revival. But see, the Lord can send a revival to the church, but the revival starts with the individual. You, me, you have to want to get to know the Lord better. And how can we do it? Samuel tells the people, and he's telling us how to put ourselves in position to have a revival. If we want to return to the Lord 
with all your hearts. Get rid of the foreign gods and your images of Asherah. We need to look into our lives and see and get rid of all the sinful things that we have in our life. Many times we do things or get involved in things with good intentions. But those things can wind up not being a godly thing in your life. They, they, might, they might not be the will that God has for your life. And the devil uses those things as distraction to keep you from his and to separate you from the will of God. It could be uh, relationships. It could be money. It could be searching for job titles, careers. See, it's just not always the sin per se of like drug use or some kind of that has drawn you. And it definitely could be those things as well. But the cares of life can cloud us up and, rear, and, and separate us from the Lord. It can distract us. See, busy, being too busy is being under, the, being under Satan's yoke. Busy, B-U-S-Y, being under Satan's yoke. We get too busy, we can't serve the Lord. We separated from the Lord. We ain't got time for church. We ain't got time for Bible study. We ain't got time to read the Bible. We ain't got time to pray. See, your life, you got to reassess your life when you get too busy to do things like that. And you need to turn your hearts to the Lord and obey him alone. Then he will rescue you from whatever situation that you're going through. Then re revival can occur. When we stop worrying about selling fish, salmons, and cookies to raise money for the church and just start worrying about preaching and listening and praying for God's word and allowing God's word to change our lives. If we get caught up in what, how can we make our church name great or things of that nature and the church get sidetracked as well and lose the purpose of the church is to change and to save lives for Christ to tell the world about Christ. We get the great commission, the mandate of the church. And when we find ourselves in a way we need a revival, the church needs a revival. Then now your church needs a revival. We talked about how we can see a revival in ourselves. Now we see reason why our church needs revival. It's not holding to the mission that God mandated for the church. It needs a revival. So let's look at God's people. So the Israelites got rid, verse 4, of their images of Baal and Asherah and worshiped the Lord. See, they took mental and physical action. See, when you want to come back to God, if we want to come back to God, we got to take mental and physical action. The mental action was they gave their minds and their hearts and their attention to the Lord first. They seeking first the kingdom of heaven. Of heaven. Then they took physical action. They actually changed their lives. They read the things of themselves, of the things that, uh, that they were supposed to get rid, that they need to get rid of in their lives. They stopped doing the things that they used to do. They stopped doing the things that God has will for us to do. Let's look and see what happened in doing so. See, then Samuel told them, gather all of Israel to Mizpah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. So they gathered at Mizpah, and in a great ceremony, drew water from a well and poured it out before the Lord. They also went without food all day and confessed that they had sinned against the Lord. It was at Mizpah that Samuel became Israel's judge. Now, in the process of these next few verses, we see the action that they took. See, see, faith is believing and it's also action. That makes faith. They took action. See, they began to pray to the Lord with a repentant heart. See, repentant heart. They're not praying selfish prayers. Lord, give me a thousand dollars. Help me get another job. Help me, help me get another car. Help me 
See, the Kaime know they're praying repentant prayers, prayers for thanksgiving, pray, prayers for forgiveness. And they poured out water to the Lord, which symbolized them giving their life, saying that they're committing their life for the Lord. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and what? All these things. So when we put ourselves in that position, then the Lord certainly hears our prayers and will honor our prayers. When we find ourselves in that position before the Lord, see? That's the position we had to find ourselves in before the Lord, repentant and respectful. They fasted before the Lord, the entire nation. And says then, that's when Samuel became the judge. And we know Samuel was the last judge of Israel. Because in the very next chapter, we see God's people wanting a king. They want to be like, the people and the nations around them. They wanted a king to rule over them. Samuel telling the people what God had told him that they would regret the fact that they want a king. Samuel cried and lamented over the fact of the people requesting a king. And the Lord had to come to Samuel and told him, don't stop crying, Samuel. They have not rejected you, but they have rejected me. See, and having a king, see, they didn't understand God's people. We must understand as well that we have a king. Our king is the Lord. See, we don't need no human man ruling over us per se. We should our first, we should follow first the Lord. See, they, they wanted a king to carry them into battle, a king to do this for them a king to speak for them instead of trusting the Lord to do it. So we are to trust the Lord, not man, to rule over us. Now, when the Philistines rulers heard that Israel had gathered at Mizpah, they mobilized their army and advanced. Now, notice that it speaks to our life each and every day. When we decide to come back to God, when we decide to give ourselves to Christ, we make up our mind and our heart to live for Christ. What does Satan do? He launches his attack to try to throw us off from going back to God, try to discourage us, and do whatever he can to keep us from going back to Christ. We get sick or we lose a job or we lose our kids begin to act up or this happened or that happened. Our car breaks down and we don't have no way to fix it. He sends a text in our lives. But what we said, do not worry. Seek ye the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. See, that's the position that God's people are in. They, their heart and minds are set up to seek and to follow the Lord. And let's look how the, the Lord responds in the same way he will respond to us. See, it said the Israelites were badly frightened when they learned that the Philistines were approaching. Don't stop pleading with the Lord, our God, to save us, save us from the Philistines. See, they are now the people, instead of them taking the ark into battle, thinking that the ark is going to save them. Now the ark is back. Now they're not asking for the ark. What are they doing now? They're praying to the God that owns the ark. See, now... They're looking for a relationship with the living God. See, now they're praying that continue to pray. They're telling Samuel to continue to pray. And that's what we are to do, to pray to the Lord. See, carry our supplications to the Lord. They begged Samuel. So Samuel took a young lamb and offered it to the Lord as a whole burnt offering. He pleaded with the Lord to help Israel. And look what it said. And the Lord answered him. Just as Samuel was sacrificing the burnt offering, the Philistines arrived to attack Israel. Just when he was getting to the point of burning the sacrifice to the Lord, the Philistine attacks. Satan jumps out and tries to prevent us. And he does it to us 
to this day as one of his tactics to discourage us, to distract us, to make us come back, to make us fear, fearful of changing for the better. See, we got to trust, have faith. But the Lord spoke with a mighty voice of thunder from heaven that day. See, it says, and, and, and the King James Version said, but the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day. See, the Lord moved. Now, he could literally have been thunder, but whatever, he, he moved in a mighty way that put the people in a raid. It confused and scared the Philistine army. They, they knew that something was moving that was more powerful than they were and the most powerful thing that they had ever experienced. Now, I don't find out, I believe everything that the Bible says for sure, but we can just uh, think about sometime when thunder has hit, like seemed like it had just struck, well, thunder don't strike, but it has rumbled around our houses. When we're in our houses or in the building and it's like it shakes the whole building. So we easily can imagine when the Lord wants to get our attention let you know that he is in the building we can easily see that he made a loud thunderous situation would put them in array in disarray and they began to run they became discomfited as it said in the king's james version and as they became discomfited and ran away god's people israel the army of israel chased them from mispah to a place called beth car slaughtering them all along the way. See, the Lord will fight our battles. What we must do, seek first the kingdom of God. See, once we can put ourselves in the right position, the Lord will bring us to victory. See, he has done it so many times in our life. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and all of these things. See, no need to worry. Shouldn't be worrying about anything. Should be praying and believing. And we still have trouble, then we have to do what our lesson wants us to do. Now, to bring our lesson to a close, we are to our, our key verse, verse 12. Samuel then took a large stone and placed it between the towns of Mizpah and Shesna. He named it Ebenezer, which means the stone of help. For he said, up until this point, the Lord has helped us. So the Philistines, I'm going to read verse 13. So the Philistines were subdued and didn't invade Israel again for some time. And throughout Samuel's lifetime, the Lord's powerful hand was raised against the Philistines. So looking at verse 12, and bring our lesson to a close. Samuel took a stone and placed it in between Mizpah and Shesna. He placed it in the place where the Lord brought them great victory, and he named it Ebenezer. And it stood for the stone of help. What does that mean for our life? See, I told you, I informed you of the key message to our story at, in our introduction. When we come into tough times in our life, we have Ebenezer stones. What is the Ebenezer stone? It is a time in your life where the Lord has came and done something for you that you did not know how you was going to get it done. And he did it for you. That is your Ebenezer stone. He helped you. That's a part, that's, some, that's a stone in your life where the Lord came and helped you. That is your Ebenezer stone. Why is that important? Because when you get in tough times, when the Philistine army surrounds you, when Satan comes to attack you, all you got to do is look back at the Ebenezer stones in your life and see how the Lord has rescued you every time. Not sometime, people. Not some, that's the thing about it. Not some, how he has rescued you every time. 
See, we have Ebenezer stones. Those, that's the testimony of who God is. He's a God of help. See, he has brought us this far. He's not going to leave us. He's going to continue to take us on. So when you get discouraged, when things get bigger than you, look at your Ebenezer stone. Think about what the Lord has done for you. But you got to remember, you got to keep God in your life. See, we have to keep God in our lives. The Israelite people had to first bring God back into their lives. And they had to put what? God, what? First. See, when we put God first, when we put him first in our lives, all these things shall come unto us. See, with Christ in our lives, we have victory over sin and we have victory over death. In other words, we have eternal life and salvation by faith in Jesus Christ. See, that's one of the victories that he's given us. So they gave the people victory against the Philistines and during that time, we have victory over sin and death with Christ in our lives. By putting Christ first, we all have victory in our Christian life as we walk and we deal with things each and every day. Put this, this scripture in your memory brain. And you know it by heart already, Philippians 4 and 13. See, how do we attack Satan when they come upon us? We also can attack him with the word. Philippians 4 and 13 says, I can do what? All things through Christ, which what? Strengthens me. Who strengthens God people in this story? It was Christ. It was God. And he will strengthen us as well. And we can find strength in our Ebenezer stones. We can look back at what the Lord has done for us. Three things we must do. We want to return back to the Lord. We must remove foreign gods. We must get rid of the things that we are put ahead of God. Jobs, money, those are generally the main things. Uh, substance abuse, uh, uh, women or men, if you depend on your uh, put relationships above God, personal gain above God. We got to remove those things. Put God first. That's the first thing you have to do. And see, when you do that, though, then you, you, you will gain everything. When you lose your things and give that to God, give everything to God, you will gain everything. Next thing we must do is direct our hearts to the Lord. Give our hearts to the Lord. Give our lives to the Lord. Follow the Lord. Live for God. Become born again in Christ Jesus. And finally, we live for God. We live to serve God. Our life should be a ministry. See, this is what we must do to return to the Lord. And once we do that, we will have victory. He will fight our life. All these things, I keep saying that. All these things will come unto us. We have, we will have even more Ebenezer stones because of the Lord bringing us victory and bringing us through the things that come upon us. See, God gave victory. He gave victory when? When they dealt with sin, when they maintained a fellowship with Christ, and when they began to serve him. That is your goal for this week. That is what you are to apply to your life. Deal with the sin in your life. Give it to Christ. Remove the idols. Maintain your fellowship with Christ. Don't lose it. Don't lose the presence of the Lord. And we are to serve him. And God will give you victory in this life and truly in the afterlife as well. And on that note, I want to bring our, our weekly Bible study lesson to a close. Ebenezer Stones. I challenge you, I challenge you right now to 
tonight in the morning, when you meditate tonight, even once you leave our message, just to think back on your life of all the things that the Lord has delivered you through. And watch your heart and your spirit become strengthened in the Lord. He does not want us to forget the things that he has done for us. See, how many of y'all know that Jesus is a rock? Jesus is the stone. See, Jesus came to be that stone. See, when we came, when we look back on our life and when we met Jesus Christ, then our life changed forever. We went from being dead to alive from being defeated to having victory, from being judged to being redeemed. See, Christ Jesus is our Ebenezer stone. He is the biggest Ebenezer stone. The other stones is what the big Ebenezer stone has done for us. Let's look back at Hebrews 13 and 6. Glory, hallelujah. Hebrews 13 and 6, let's see what it says about Jesus. It says, so that we may boldly say the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. See, the Lord is my what? Helper. What is Ebenezer? Ebenezer is, what does it stand for? The Lord is help. See, Jesus is our help. Let's look at Isaiah 28 and 16. See, the Bible was telling us all along that Jesus is our rock. He is our stone. He is our help. Isaiah 28 and 16. Once we get to 28 and 16, it reads, Therefore, thus said the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a what? A stone, a tried stone, a precious stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Glory, hallelujah. See, Jesus is that rock. See, the one who relies on him will never be stricken with panic. Don't win. What was Jesus teaching? What was he teaching on the Sermon Mount? Do not worry. Seek first the kingdom, his kingdom, his righteousness, and all these things. I got you. See, look at the Ebenezer stones. Look at the Ebenezer stone, the stone, a tried stone, a precious stone, a sure foundation. It's Jesus. Put him first in our life. See, let's look at John 1 and 42. John, first chapter, 142. I know I'm going a little over, but these last few scriptures are going to bless you about the stone. It reads, and he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. Jesus called Cephas a stone. Now, why did he call Cephas a stone? Let's go to Matthew 16 and 16. Matthew 16 and 16. We're going to look at verses 16 through 18. All right, and it reads, And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus asked the question, Whom? Do they say I am? And Peter said, verse 16, Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Upon this Ebenezer stone, the gates of hell shall not prevent it. And the stone was not Peter per se, but it was what Peter did. What did Peter do? He confessed. 
the name of Christ, that Jesus is the son of the living God, that he is the Messiah. And in saying so, he is saying that he is our salvation. And we are to worship him. See, that is why he is the, the rock. He was called the rock because that is the foundation of our salvation. That is what is going to stand. And the gates of hell should not be able to withstand it. Our Ebenezer stones. <laughs> Jesus, the ultimate Ebenezer stone. See, Peter went on. Let's look at let's look at the rock. Peter went on and he was the first to preach in the new church. When I say the new church, the church that was established after Jesus had died on Pentecost Sunday, who gave the first sermon? Peter, who was the first to preach to the Gentiles. Many would say Paul, but it was not Paul. The first to preach the gospel to the Gentiles were Peter. Acts 10th chapter. See, that's the foundation. See, that's why he called him the rock. That is the church. And the church being established on the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the son of the living God. And being the Messiah, he is our salvation. He is the promise of our salvation. And on that note, I like to <laughs> bring it to a close because the Lord is moving in a mighty way in the lives of the believers of this word. The Lord has bought you so far. You will easily forget how far the Lord has bought you if you don't look back at your Ebenezer stone. And without looking back at the Ebenezer stones, you will forget how good the Lord has been to you. And you will begin to walk away so subtly from the presence of the Lord. Meditate and study, look back on your Ebenezer stones and let it strengthen you to go on and be prepared for every battle that you have to face. Do not worry. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Lord, we come to you today, Lord. Thank you for your grace and mercy. Lord, we come to you, Lord. Thank you for all the things that you have done for us. And Lord, we just can't say thank you enough, Lord, because without you, we would not be here today, Lord. You blessed us through sickness, Lord. You best blessed us through financial lack, Lord. You blessed us through sorrow and pain. Lord, you brought us through things that we never could figure out how we was going to get through. Lord, but you fought the battle for us, Lord. You brought us to victory. And we just want to say thank you right now to the Lord. And we want to say, Lord, we're going to go on and finish this race, Lord, knowing that you are our Ebenezer. You are our Lord that will help us and that will be with us. You have bought us this far, Lord, and we stand and depend and trust and lean on you to carry us on through to the end, dear Lord, because the battle is already won, Lord. So we're going to continue to walk and live for you, Lord. Lord, if there's anything in our life that needs to be removed, Lord, bring it to the light in our lives, Lord, and have us, each and every one of us, to humble ourselves and remove those things, Lord. And when we Put it before you, Lord. We're praying, Lord, that you remove those sinful things and those things out of our lives so that we can walk in total companionship and completely for you, Lord, with you first in our lives. And we stand and believe and walk in your word that we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness that you will provide all the things that we need. Lord, we believe and we walk in that faith and that confidence, Lord. So we're praying right now for healing on the lives of those who have pain and sickness right now, Lord. We're praying that you heal their bodies, Lord. Heal their spirits, Lord. And, Lord, continue to strengthen them in their walk with Christ, dear Lord. Let their lives be a testimony 
to what you have done for them, Lord. Let your movement, let your healing be an Ebenezer stone to strengthen not only them, but others as they walk this way still, Lord. And I pray all these things in your son, Jesus' name, amen. And that brings our Bible study club lesson to a close. I sincerely apologize for the time, but I kind of got caught up in the spirit today. And, um, you know, as they say, God, God let the spirit do what it do. I pray. Yeah, don't apologize. <laughs> the word blesses you. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's right. Thank you so much. I pray that the word blesses you. And uh, I pray that each and every one of you have a blessed week. And I thank you. I can't thank you enough for joining in on our weekly Bible study. And I pray that God's word blesses your life and that it shows in the way that you live and the way that you carry yourself. And above all, I pray that it brings you victory daily and eternal salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Reverend, as you mentioned, um, it is revival season. You should consider a virtual revival. Uh, you, that's funny you said that because as I was studying this lesson, that came across my mind like five times. So I think the Lord is leading me in that direction. And um, let's, we'll see what, what happens within the next few weeks. I, I, I think that's the direction he carried me in. Just want to be sure, and I, I, I would gladly do it if that's what he's saying to me. But I, I, I truly, you speaking something that has been spoken to me in the spirit. Thank you so much. Fantastic confirmation. Yes, that's it. That's it. <laughs> One second. Right, good night, everybody. We, we miss Sister Barnett. She's been so busy, and she has um, accomplished a couple great things in life that she has been working toward. And um, if she wants to share with us, she can. If not, we just want to um, continue to, uh, we just want to say um, um, congratulations on your accomplishment. Thank you so much, Reverend Evans. Yes. Thank yes. you, thank you, great word. Thank you, thank you. And to the Jones family, we continue to keep you lifted in prayer. God, God is good and he is comforted. So continue to stay steadfast. We love you. And on that note, everybody, I'm leaving you with the watchword of Christ. Peace. 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 Amen.